interesting subject. Uh, this is talking about the after the return of Christ. And uh, then there's the judgment seat. And there's the, the overthrow of the Battle of Armageddon. Um, and then there's uh, a proclamation that goes forth. And that's what this verse is talking about. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This is talking about a, a proclamation or an invitation that goes out um, after the defeat of the northern host, the northern power, goes out into all the ends of the earth and invites everybody, uh, nations and individuals, to submit to, uh, to this new power, the divine power, to Jesus Christ. Rainbow angels uh, that are setting up, and they are setting up in Jerusalem as their headquarters for a new world government. And so, the just for those maybe who, who haven't been here, we're just right on paragraph 14 here. Um, but just going back a little bit, you see the world is invited by Christ to participate in the glory of the kingdom age. That was in paragraph eight. Paragraph 9, we talk about the leaders of the world will regard the invitation with suspicion and unbelief. And uh, then the invitation, uh, of course, that goes out is conditional on surrender. And those to whom it goes out to, the individuals and the nations, must surrender. And they must surrender all that glorifies and caters to self. All the pride of man has to be humble. And uh, then paragraph 11 dealt with the timing of the proclamation of the invitation. As, as we said, the timing is, uh, or appears to be, after Christ and the saints have gone through that first Armageddon battle in, in the area of Edom and Basra, and march into Jerusalem, set up a uh, presence there, a king, uh, kingdom there, a provisional, or you might say smaller than what it eventually will be, but it's, it starts small and grows, and uh, then we talked about the period of the proclamation, uh, or this invitation, and uh, then paragraph 13 dealt with the last terrible 40 year period of the world's opportunity and judgments. So this proclamation goes out um, after the first 10 years, which occupy the uh, judgment at Sinai, and uh, the destruction of the northern coast, and the march into Jerusalem, it kind of appears to take place in the, maybe the first 10 years, at least that's what is suggested. And then the last terrible 40 years will be the time of that proclamation and onward, uh, dealing with all those who, who do not submit to it. And of course, uh, when we were talking about the, the nations, um, Regarding this proclamation or this invitation with suspicion and unbelief, we looked at many of the current day thinking about how people regard the Antichrist. And the way they regard the Antichrist is that they think the Antichrist will be one who will come into Jerusalem and set up a kingdom there and build a temple there. And that will be the identifying marks of the Antichrist. So you can see how that they will regard this with such suspicion. And this invitation because they will look on the real thing and call it the Antichrist. And paragraph 14 was where we ended up last time, talked about the proclamation will begin an incremental establishment of the kingdom. As we said, it, it begins it begins rather small and grows. And it starts in Jerusalem. <coughs> so paragraph 14, we'll just go to that and look at the summary of it where the author draws a parallel there between David in the past and, of course, Christ in the future, in the judgment period of the millennial establishment. And you remember where the destroying angel, we're, just, uh, we're going to be reading that here very, very shortly in our readings about where David numbered the people. And, of course, there was judgment on the nation because of that, and the destroying angel stopped, and, and God stopped the destroying angel uh, almost hoovering over the city of Jerusalem 
and David was able to see it and see this angel and realized, uh, you know, and that was like a, a mid-heaven proclamation at that time to to David and the nation to to repent um, before further judgments came on them, which they did. So there's a parallel drawn there between David and Christ in that period of the millennial establishment and, and also draw, uh, drew a bit of a parallel between Solomon and Christ in the period after the enemies of the new order had been dealt with. Solomon was a, a man of peace, reigned over the kingdom after David had subjected everything and brought it into subjection. And then Solomon was the one who built the temple and so he typified that period of Christ and the saints when after the uh, the world orders have been dealt with and the temple is built and the, and the reign of peace begins. David was a man of war and as such fulfilled the task of vanquishing the enemies of Israel and establishing the kingdom first over Judah and then over the entire 12 tribes. Again, just like David had done. So some good parallels there. I think we, we ended up talking about in the discussion about how the you know, the, the nations of the of the world have to be humbled. They have to be brought brought low. And uh, that is something in this invitation that won't won't happen with regard to many of them. The pride of man will get in the way and it will have to be dealt with um, in a in a terrible period of judgments called the last terrible forty years. And of course we ended up also talking a little bit about the the uh, you know the fact that things are changing fast even in the world today. You see the U.S. struggling with an enormous debt and, and deficit, and all really it's not just the U.S. It's all the nations of the world are struggling with that, and, and so it's almost like a bit of a preparation period for this for this time. I'm already being humbled a little bit. So that takes us then to paragraph uh, 15 out of the 22 paragraphs in this, in this uh, section. Paragraph 15 tells us uh, about the initial gathering of the tribe of Judah to be one of the results of the proclamation. It says that gathering of Israelites of the tribe of Judah, one of a city and two of a family to Zion, <coughs> will result from the angel of angel proclamation in mid-heaven. Being fed by pastors according to Yahweh's own heart, with knowledge and understanding, the veil will be removed from the minds of many who will become willing to emigrate from among the nations and return to their fatherland. A couple, par- couple passages probably to look at there. Jeremiah 3.14 talking about one of a city and two of a family. Uh, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you, one of a city, and two of a family, and will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors, according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And also quoted from Psalm 110, verse 3. The Lord shall send thy, the rod of thy strength, verse 2, out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. So he says, uh, Yahweh, the man of war, will bring them there. I will bring you, said he, to Zion. He will do this by the influence of his victorious power. Having expelled the Anglo-Indian lion or the British Empire from the land, that power will probably receive with reverence the angel proclamation and consent to place its marine at the disposal of the man Christ Jesus styled in the English version, the Lord of Hosts. This indeed will certainly be the case. He will command the ships of Tartar, and they will obey, for what is testified they do is done in obedience to his will. The last chapter of Isaiah and the 19th verse testifies to the angel proclamation of Tartar 
And the next verse records the result. Let's uh, put that up, the 19th verse. I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations to Tarshish, Pool, and Lud, that draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off that have not heard my name, my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations, upon horses and in chariots and in litters, upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. So that's kind of going along with what Brother Thomas is saying, or what the author is saying, that these, uh, these nations styled, you know, Tarshish, Pol, and Lud, which are the indicative of the, the latter day marine power of the British Empire, will, will work as an assistant in bringing the people of Israel, the people of Judah, I should say, out of, out of the lands gathering into that area. Uh, yeah, the next verse records the result, which you read. The sounders of the truth are effective bowmen. Their words move the nations of Tarshish, Pol, Ruth, Tubal, and Javan to do the will of Yahweh and to bring his people as an offering to him in Jerusalem. Thus they fly as a cloud and as doves to their windows in the fleet ships of Tarshish, which convey the sons of Zion, the Jews, from far with their silver and gold to the place where the name of Yahweh is enthroned. Couple of passages there, Isaiah 60, verses 8 and 9. Um, Who are these that fly as a cloud, as the doves to their windows? Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, unto the name of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. And I think verse 18 Violence shall no more be heard in thy land. Wasting our destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. And also Jeremiah three seventeen. <coughs> At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. So, just in summarizing that paragraph. What it appears to be saying here is that a part of this transition process, this transition of the of the uh, kingdom of God, uh, is occupied by the drawing out of all nations, the two tribes of Judah, and the remnants of the Jewish diaspora. It is speculated here that the power and fleets of the British Empire will be occupied in this process, as will her young lions, which possibly refers to I'm just wondering if that uh, reference to the ships might not include aircraft and all kinds of. I think it's speaking in 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 biblical language of what was the most advanced tools that they had at that time, and, and I think can be extended to what would be the most advanced tools of modern times. You know, so yeah, I think the point is. Uh, what does he mean having expelled the anger in the land which is written from the land which land Israel? yeah they're, they're in there it appears that they're in there as we saw from the clip uh, last Sunday I think that they are in there as, as a protector a protector of, of Jerusalem and when the the uh, Northern power, which appears at that time to be, you know, it's come down through the land through Turkey and is based in Egypt. Here's tidings from the east, which is where Christ and the saints are, and from the north, which would be where the, south, the power of the south is in Jerusalem. And they will move up to Jerusalem and will will clear it. They will uh, and and uh, empty it of the of the uh, power of the south, which is the you know the what was in brother. Thomas' time, the British Empire. And, you know, well, if, it, if it 
clean the arches or whatever leads your crown down, well, of course there's no leadership as a nation. Mm-hmm. They'll be defeated, though, won't they? They'll, they'll be defeated uh, and you look by the, by the northern invader and will be, you know, greatly humbled by that time and which will prepare them to accept the this new power in the earth. It, that's that appears to be what prophecy where prophecy leads us in that. You can see where their bread and butter lies. Yeah. Gordon? Can you, can you go back to that link on uh, Isaiah nineteen uh, nineteen first verse at the the last chapter of Isaiah 19? Yeah, there was a verse beyond what you read there that okay. I had a question on. He shall bring all your brethren for an offering, that one? Yeah. Unto the Lord out of all nations, on horses and chariots and litters, on mules, on swift beasts, and to my holy mountain. Verse 21, and I will also take them for priests and for Levites, said the Lord. Um, is that a reference to the believers amongst the Gentiles being kings and priests? Or is that I think that that is the them there is talking about the, your brethren. <coughs> the, out of the, but, you know, all nations, people out of all nations will take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and I want to become a part of you so there will be a lot of, you know, the, be like in a, the mortal population will be like adopted Jews. But is that is that uh, new converts that have uh, t- uh, responded to the to the proclamation? I think that's speaking of it's the, I will take all of them, not all of them, but all of them, out of them, right. uh, for priests and Levites, and that would be speaking, I think, of the mortal administrators in the, in the temple administration that, that is being built about the same time. Okay, so they would be. So mortal. That's, that's my opinion. Right? Yeah, I, I realize some of this yeah. is yeah. opinion. The judgment will have been right. already. Mm-hmm. Yes, so oh, yeah. the judgment is. According to the timeline that we have, the judgment will have you know, be, uh, been 10 years ago or so. So it's new, fresh converts, you right. might say. Because on, you know, on the timeline, it appears that the time of the proclamation, as it goes out, is also the period of the building of the temple in Jerusalem, which was, which is another, you know, that will stir up nations and say, "Oh, oh here, look at this. This is, this is the Antichrist. This is what we expected you to do." summary there uh, that's talking about after Christ's return? Yes. So the British fleets will be involved in bringing the Jews and the remnants of the Jews, I guess, back mm-hmm. to the land? That appears to be the indication from that, Isaiah. You know, when yeah. would that be? Uh, that would be during the, during the construction of the temple, but before the overthrow of the of uh, the nations that remain, um, the uh, political church, state church system. Sure. It might be, uh, we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago, I think, about uh, the ones that are in the land are kind of termed Judah, and uh, how are the um, dispersed, are kind of called Ephraim, aren't they? Isn't that, am I right about that? Well, yes and no. I mean, there, in a spiritual sense, that is true. And yeah. There's also the literal tribes of Israel, too. And, um, it could be a double application. You know, we talk about how we're supposed to get to the promised land for judgment, and there's been speculation on that. Well, how are we going to get there and everything? Well, that kind of... 
basically says it, doesn't it? If the British fleets are going to be uh, active as well as the U.S., that kind of indicates how a guy would get over there, wouldn't it? Right. Very possibly, and you know, but nothing restricts God's power. You know, if He wants you over there, you, no, I just you know just it's find been yourself a, there. You know, it's been a question that yeah. some people think, well, we'll just be kind of zoomed over there in the air yeah. or whatever, but. Uh, I've never heard of that before. After Christ's return, the ships are still going to be floating on the ocean. I never ever thought about that. I thought they'd be wiped right out. I thought Russia was the last army standing. Oh, yeah, no, no, they're one of the first to be taken out, uh, and there's still a lot of uh, a lot of cleanup to do in the world yet after that. Who's the first? The US? Russia, the Northern Invader. The first to be knocked out? Yeah. I thought U.S. fell or submitted first to Christ. Oh no, I'm talking about those who don't submit. Uh, those who do not submit to Him. Oh. Yeah. You know, they kind of showed a, a, a process of it, and and you know sometimes we think, oh, okay, once the saints are there, they'll destroy everything, and the kingdom will be set up. But it's going to take quite a few years, and it yeah. sort of grows from that it's, center. It's a 15 year. You know, this again, a lot of these things are speculation. You can't sort of say this is exactly what's going to happen, but it appears that there's a 50 year period. And, uh, you know, and according to the type under the Day of Atonement, where the trumpet was blown, uh, it appears to be a, you know, there was a 10 day interval then between the blowing of the trumpet to the Day of Atonement. And that appears, and that was a period when the Israelites were to prepare for the Day of Atonement. And there was a at the start of this section, he drew quite a quite a similarity between that using a day for a year. Uh, that you know the, the blowing of the trumpet was like the call. It was like this proclamation going out, and there was a ten day, ten year period for this uh, proclamation to have its effect before you know, the final thirty years would would take place. Paragraph twelve. The period. I'm just confused how that that fits with the ships, um, because there's a verse in Ezekiel that tells us that the scattered Jews will be brought into the wilderness of the peoples, which is northern Europe, and that's where they will be congregated and they will be used as God's battle axe to fight against the northern host for that 30 year period. I think that's after this. I think there's a I think this is talking about a very preliminary period when when the initial gathering uh, is taking place, bringing the, the two tribes of Judah into the land, and they will be used to go then out to their brethren and will help to bring them in. Okay. And so this is this is quite a bit before that. Okay. Gordon? Well, I mentioned uh, it's uh, in incremental uh, spreading of the power of uh, Christ and Christ. Right. Right. <coughs> and that sort of reminds us of the way the land was possessed when uh, Israel uh, came out from Egypt. It was, uh, you know, it was sort of designated as their possession, but it, they didn't possess it all at once. Right. They, the uh, God used, um, uh, I think it was uh, uh, hornets and whatnot to drive out the inhabitants. So. There might be a parallel there, and it's quite often there is kind of a, a type and anti type you might see in scriptural terms. And it, as I understand it, if I understand it right, the, uh, the final holdout will be the Catholic Church, Rome. That will be the. Rome and her daughters, you know, that, yeah, that appears, and that will be a very strong, not only very strong. <clears throat> religious and ecclesiastical system, but a very strong political system that uh, it will evolve into at that time. Uh, because there will be a power vacuum with the destruction of the northern invader, and there will be a, a you know these uh, these people that are left, the, the leaders of the church, and everything will see a, a tremendous need to restructure against this uh, new threat to what they perceive as the enemy of God. And we'll restructure both, you know, ecclesiastically and politically. That's uh, where this take this over. 
to cover that 40, 50 year period. That's a whole new generation. That's right. So the thinking is going not be the old thinking that's where they come in on year one. But that's a whole generation in them, that's all they've seen is this. And and you know, there's there's a kind of poetic justice to that or or a or a similarity at least uh, to the bringing of the children of Israel out of the land. It was a whole new generation involved through that process. And, uh, you know, and it, it compared this time to the 40 year period of the uh, bringing of the nation of Israel through from Egypt originally. So there's, there's, there's some similarities there. Ms. Gordon? Just going back to that. Um, um, the, the Roman system uh, resisting, they will be the greatest proponents of the Antichrist theory. And, and that includes not only Roman Catholics, but all so called Christians, or, or mo- a majority of so called Christians who <coughs> subscribe to the, uh, to the present day teaching on the Antichrist. Right. And it is very widespread. Here, I'm sorry. Um, is it is it true also to understand that this power at the end, uh, while we might think of it as Roman, it really goes back to Babel, the oh, first right. organized the man of sin. system against God, yeah. and then that transferred to Rome. But Rome itself, as far as I understand, will be destroyed. Mm-hmm. We'll at ten years in at the Battle of Armageddon, or shortly after. But then that system will move north to Russia. And that will basically be the hub of the third Babylon, which is involving all the systems that organize against God. That's the way I've had it described to me. Um, that's your three, like it started with uh, with Babylon, with Babel, sorry, and uh, and it continues right through. So it's not really Roman Catholics anymore, although that will be a large uh, part of that final system. It's the full development of the man of exactly. sin power. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> you know, and just where exactly they will be headquartered, I've, I've heard the explanation that you have too, and that very, very possibly could be. It also I've heard explanations that it, it could still be in Rome, and that, uh, and that, that find there, there's still a, could be another earthquake that will demolish Rome at the, you know, the final outcome of things. So might save it for the very last. You know, it's there's a lot of. Um, Quite a bit of latitude on, on some of this, but not, it's not the prophecy is not specific as to exact time, but there, yet the general picture is very clear. Yeah. I don't know. I could just go back here to this. Uh, I did have this clip here where it brings this out any clearer or not. Yeah, this is why I was looking for this. This this is where uh, God consolidates his power in the land of Israel, marches against the upstart power in in Jerusalem. And then this is where Christ is uh, in the saints in this land of Midian, and the, the Armageddon battle occurs there. You can see the image there and the little stone coming down, hitting the image on its feet, and uh, demolishes it and becomes like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. In the Daniel rec- record and is uh, moved out, and uh, and of course we had previously seen. We went back further in this clip. We previously seen where the green, which symbolizes the power of the south, was in in and circled Jerusalem. <coughs> when the northern invader, which is symbolized here by the black color, moved up, they drove that out along with the inhabitants of, of Israel in that conflict there. And now, when they're defeated by Christ and the saints, of course, that uh, they're demolished, uh, you know, their power is is overthrown in the area of Jerusalem as well, and they're scattered, as Ezekiel 38 talks about their uh, every man's sword against his brother and plead with him with uh, pestilence and blood and rain upon him and upon his bands and overflowing rain, and they will be driven out at at that point into the into the area of Syria. Um, and then 
once the Gogian army, the enemy in the land is destroyed and reduced to one sixth of his forces by his own mutual self slaughter and by the pestilence and judgment of the elements uh, brought on him by God. The sixth part of him retreats into Assyria and God's land is at last completely freed of its enemies. And uh, it appears there's some speculation maybe just before Christ goes up into Jerusalem or just after, but this is where the people are brought again also to the land of Egypt. This will be the, the uh, Jews that have uh, been driven down in there from the land of Egypt and from probably many other parts of the earth because Egypt sometimes is a, is a symbol of darkness and of the nations of the world. And that's kind of what we're talking about now, about them being, you know, they, they'll be brought out by, by the ships of Tarshish, uh, as well as, of course, Christ and the saints, uh, the, that power will go down into, into Egypt and draw them, draw them out as well, as the of Zechariah delivers a remnant of the refugee Jews from the land of Egypt, and uh, they go to Jerusalem uh, via Moab, and uh, Christ and the rainbow angels, uh, Christ and the saints of the rainbow angels begin their victory march into Jerusalem, and of course it's symbolized here by the, by the sun, the sun of righteousness, and uh, they go up into the land, they go through the area from the, the Judean fault line, this is what we were talking about, I think on the other day, Wednesday or whatever it was, that there's a, an earth, you know, there's a fault line goes, the one vertically, your north and south, goes right down to Madagascar through through uh, northern Africa and Egypt, and then there's these tentacles, these fault lines, one of which runs right through the center of Mount Wallace, and that will split that time, and uh, that activity will uh, prepare a, a way of a, a chasm or a, a pathway for the march of rainbow angels to go up and uh, it will be a very great valley we're told here in Zechariah 14 and 4 and that will be a pathway for the for the uh, Christ and the saints to, to move up through that and that's where they would become thrown in Jerusalem and it you know whether the people of the of the tribes of Judah will go in there at that time with them, or whether they would be there to greet them. It almost appears that they might be there to greet them. So you know, uh, here's look on the yeah. There's, there's a remnant. There is a remnant. So that's right. Yeah. We would have seen that earlier in the clip here. This would be just a, a remnant that that were that escaped as well as those brought out from other parts of the earth. And it appears that, you know, we, we think that the prophecy about the Jews going back to the land has been fulfilled today. But uh, I noticed that Brother Roberts didn't feel that that's fulfilled until after Christ returns. And this, is, this fulfills all the prophecies about the return of the Jews. And... Uh, you know, they, it appears that they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And so it appears that they are there, uh, actually waiting for him when he comes in. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem. So their, their hearts have changed, and they, they know now that the one that they have rejected is, is the head of the corner. He's the... He's the, the Messiah that we've been looking for all this time. So then we see them enthroned in, in uh, Jerusalem and in the immediate area. There's seven months in the cleaning up of the, the remnants. Uh, as we said, there's a sixth of the enemy pursued uh, back into Assyria. And uh, it says, They shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto go a place there of graves in Israel, and there shall they bury go in all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gulf. And after that, in the seven months, shall the house of Israel be burying of them that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified. And then of course, his glory fills that part of the land that, that's what we call the incremental 
Uh, will first be seen the establishment of his of the kingdom in Basra, in Eden. Now it's come up into Jerusalem, and it uh, just overspreads um, that part of, of the area called Eden, the Garden of God. And then, of course, from there it, it grows, and grows, and grows, and eventually covers the, the world. Yes. I'm sorry. Just a question. Uh, that statement out of Egypt, have I called my son? That would be. That uh, referred to Christ uh, was fulfilled yeah. there, but it's possible that a latter day fulfillment in the people of Israel as well. I, I think it's been applied. Yeah, that it way. did apply to Christ at one time, but I thought it applied more to Jesus. Yeah. 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 So the earthquake has already happened by this before this. An earthquake has happened, whether that is the one there it, it speaks about further earthquakes too, you know. But that is the one that splits the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives. A huge earthquake in the land out that very likely could be the one that topples the uh, the centers of the world and possibly Rome. Yeah, not even the last major earthquake has happened in that country or um, you know, uh, I I'm not, there have been earthquakes, I think, just very recently, but the last major one, this toppled buildings there was in 747, 747 after Christ. Okay. I watched the, I watched the deal the other day on earthquakes and they were just talking about the one out in the west coast here and, uh, and talking about some other major ones around the world. But that one out there happened, the major part happened in the 1700s, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they were talking normally the, the, the most earthquakes tend to take a 500 year break and then they happen again. So I guess we're way beyond that one for the West Coast. But and the way the activity happens in these fissures of the earth and the earth's crust is that you know, there's a movement there all the time. And and of course they, they kind of stick together and stick together and there's more and more pressure builds and builds and builds and all of a sudden there's a, a release and you know, that results in the earthquake and 500 years or a period of time like that is usually you know, sufficient to build up that kind of pressure that it takes to so release a major earthquake but they think we're well we're doing right now we just find time uh, Gordon? Uh, in that one of those clips there, you showed that that valley is a way, uh, a way made for for uh, the kings and the sun of the sun's rising, which is Christ the same. Mm -hmm. Is that the same uh, uh, valley where the water uh, yeah. issues and, and flows south and north? What we don't sometimes think about is that is going to change the whole topographical lay of that land. And Jerusalem right now is about 2,300 feet high. It's going to come down to about 1,600 feet according to, you know, what various ones who have studied it, uh, you know, and, and make like a plateau there. That's about what it would take to make a plateau. Yeah. And the Dead Sea is felt will rise to about 600 feet above sea level. And so that's a huge difference. That only means there's maybe about a thousand feet between the the lowest part of the land, uh, you know, the Dead Sea and and uh, the area of the temple. But it would be a nice, you know, just a nice gentle run for a for a flow of water to go down. And of course, it would also be a, a gentle climb for the rainbow angel to march up through there too. So it's, it, it, changes the whole structure of the, of the land of, of Israel. And it appears that in times past, um, in the time of Lot and Abraham, that the whole area was very a very fertile valley, not the huge chasm that we see now. And some have speculated that at, the time, at that time, before the reigning of, um, of fire and brimstone in Sodom and Gomorrah, that the land could have been very much like what it will be in the future. But that destroyed all that and created a huge chasm there and where the, the Dead Sea then the waters of the Dead Sea um, collected. 
Did you say the dead sea is going to rise 600 feet above sea level? Yeah. I'm just noticing here it's it's 1,640 feet below sea level right yeah. now. That is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, stormy wind fulfilling his word is where I get that information from. It's it's a Christadelphian book that studied the the effects of the earthquake and how it, it's speculation. I mean, we have to understand that. But yeah, but it's I mean, interesting. You can imagine the magnitude of the earthquake that would right. cause. Absolutely. <coughs> We're lucky to have a mountain left. <laughs> Period. Anyway, I guess that covers our time for the day. Yeah.